know that we are in the middle, kind of on the descent, if you will, of a series called Value Driven Life, living life on purpose, living a life with purpose. And so we are going over the seven core values of our church. And so we felt that it was necessary to let people know who we want to be as a church. What are we building the foundation of it? Because our values are what uh, is going to kind of center us and dictate what we do, what decisions we make, what we get involved in, what we don't get involved in. And so we thought it was important for you to know. But what we've also done is taken those values and, and looked at the aspect of that value from a personal perspective. How can I take this value and apply it to my life and live it out? And I don't know about you, but I think the series has been incredible. Uh, I'm a little biased though, right? Uh, but man, it's been, it's just been solid. There's been a lot of good application. Pastor Jay has knocked it out of the park recently. And uh, I know I kind of beat you up a little bit last week, but uh, I'm going to make it up to you today because value number five is the value of encouragement, the value of encouragement. And you may be thinking like, that's kind of a weird value for church, right? Like church is encouraging. Why do you say that you value that? Well, I think that it's safe to say it doesn't take much for you and I to look around our society, to look around at the people that live around us and all throughout the world and see that we have a world that is full of tired, weary, exhausted, some hopeless, and some that are very, very discouraged. Like that is all around us. And the sad truth in reality is that oftentimes these people who feel very discouraged step into a church building or a church service and they leave that experience, they leave that service feeling the exact same way that they came in. I don't know about you, but I feel like the church should be the absolute last place that someone should come in and, and be a part of an experience and leave feeling discouraged. And so we made that a value because we want to put that at the forefront of who we are as a church, that people will come to Seven Cities Church. They will experience Jesus in our worship experiences and leave refreshed, leave recharged, leave refocused, and leave encouraged like Ephesians 4 says to build each other up like that is who we want to be as a church and so we are putting that at the front of us and so man we we hope that you have felt that we pray that you have felt that we hope and pray that you continue to feel that now let me just caveat that or kind of speak on the flip side of that I want you to hear and if you've been along with us for any amount of time, you already know this, just because we want people to feel encouraged and refreshed and recharged does not mean that we are going to speak, preach, teach, and lead a lot of fluff, all right? We can preach and teach the Word of God, the truth, and still have people leave encouraged. We're not going to beat around that. The, the, the main goal or, or the way that you do that, there, there is a very uh, there is a very ap ap applicable way for us to teach and, and, and preach the word of God and the truth, those that sometimes are hard to swallow and hard to listen to and hard to receive and still have someone feel encouraged. Like, I don't know about you, you, you know my preaching style and the way that, that I teach, I'm kind of fired up. Like, let me tell you something. When I go to church or when I'm sitting in a worship experience and I get my toes stepped on, I'm like, come on, somebody. Like, I feel encouraged. Like, step on them, bruise them, cut them off, whatever you got to do to get what's not of you, God, out of me, right? Like, that's what I want. And, 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 and I know that everybody's not like that. You're like, Brian, I, I like Pastor Jay better than you anyway because you're too much for me, right? Like, that's okay. You got to deal with me too. But, <laughs> but, but listen, there is a way to teach this. This is the truth that is covered in love. As a matter of fact, it, it is love. And it's also covered in grace and it's covered in forgiveness and it's covered in mercy and it's filled with encouragement. And so we get to teach this to you on a weekly basis and we pray that you leave here feeling encouraged. So that is who we want to be as a church. That is what we want to keep in front of us. We value encouragement. And now I want to teach you how to value encouragement in your own life. And some of you are like, well, I already know how to do that. That's awesome. All right. Uh, but I want, to, I want to share a few things with you. I want to, I want to start with a question. Um, it's, I guess, kind of trivial, like Bible trivia, if you will. 
Like, what do you know about the guy named Barnabas in the Bible? There's a guy by the name of Barnabas in the Bible. Some of you are like, Barna what? Like, I thought that was like a circus back in the day or something, right? Like, and then maybe some of you are like, yeah, yeah, I've heard of that guy. He was the one who had a disagreement with Paul and they split ways. Yep, that's true. And maybe you're like, all right, well, I know a lot about Barnabas. That's great too. But I want, I want to introduce Barnabas to you and share with you uh, some things about Barnabas' life that I feel will, will, will teach us and give us a... a a different, not a different perspective, but at least a fresh perspective, maybe a different perspective on what it looks like to be an encourager. And so we don't see a ton about Barnabas. Most of what we see is in the book of Acts. And he is actually introduced in chapter four of the book of Acts. And I'm going to read two. We're going we're to cover a good bit today. We're going to be in Acts, but I'm going to jump around just a little bit um, and share a few different uh, passages with you. But so in Acts chapter 4, verse 36, this is the first time that we see Barnabas mentioned. And it says this, For instance, there was Joseph, the one the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. All right, so this guy Barnabas, that's not even his name. Like, this is his nickname. His name is Joseph, but he is such an encourager. He is this natural encourager that the apostles nicknamed him Barnabas. And this nickname is, is pretty grand, if you will. And what I mean by that is like, I don't know about you, but I have people in my life who I have a nickname for them and nobody else calls them that but me, right? Like my best friend, or maybe you call your spouse by a nickname that nobody else, you know, is even, they better not dare call her that, right? You know what I mean? But like, we have nicknames for certain like this wasn't just like a couple friends who who gave him this nickname the apostles named him Barnabas because he was the son of encouragement because he was this encourager and it's also listed by his nickname all throughout scripture every time we see his name mentioned and so I think it's safe to say as we introduce Barnabas that this dude was an encourager like he was a natural encourager and that was what people knew him as they knew him as an encourager the next thing that I want to show you that we see about Barnabas is in chapter 11, and it says this in verse 24, the first part. Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit, and strong in faith. All right? So if you're like me, I like Cliff Notes, right? So the Cliff Notes version of Barnabas, like who was he? What kind of man was he? It was pretty simple. One, he was a natural encourager. Everywhere that he went, it seems that he constantly lived his life on display in regards to encouraging other people. And then he was full of the Holy Spirit. He was strong in his faith and he was a good man. I don't know about you, but that's the kind of person I would want to be known for. Like, hey, I want to be known to be full of the Holy Spirit, strong in my faith, a good person, and one who is a natural encourager. And so as we dive into this aspect of encouragement, this value of encouragement, I was thinking what better person to look at the one who is called the son of encouragement in scripture, the one who lived his life as a natural encourager. Like what can we, what can you and I learn from him in regards to encouragement? And so I have three things for you. Go figure, right? I'm going to trick y'all one day. I'm going to come out with like 14 and y'all going to be like, what? But, uh, but three points for you today that I want to pull from his life and kind of let you see. And the first one would be this, encouraging others sometimes is not about words. Encouraging others is sometimes not about words, all right? And some of you are like, what, what is, what's going on? All right, let's dive in. I got two things uh, in the life of Barnabas that I want to show you connected to this, okay? Let's go back to Acts chapter 4 where we introduced Barnabas. And we're going to back up just a couple verses in verse 34. It says, there were no needy people among them. All right. We're talking about the early church. We talked about this last week. We looked at Acts chapter two. Now we're in Acts chapter four. Remember, we have a group of people with a common interest, a common mission who have formed a community. And now this early church is forming and growing and spreading like crazy. And we, here we see it again. They're giving stuff away. Verse 34, there were no needy people among them. Because those who own land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles and give to those in need. 
Verse 36, where we see Barnabas, for instance, there was Joseph, the one of the apostles, nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He was from the tribe of Levi and came from the island of Cyprus. Verse 37, here, get this. He sold a field he owned and brought the money to the apostles. And so you're like, all right, Brian, we just talked about generosity. What does this have to do with encouragement? Well, it has a lot to do with encouragement because generosity is actually twofold. And here's what I mean by that. Uh, Barnabas was encouraging people without ever having to speak a word, without having to use words. And here's what I mean. The, the community of believers, they looked around and they saw those that were in need and they gave and they supplied their needs. They met their needs without ever having to say a word. And maybe you're like, I'm not really getting this. Listen, you can be encouraged by having a need met without anybody ever saying a word to you, right? Right. Have you ever walked out to the mailbox and, and before you walked out, you were figuring out your budget and you realized that you had more going out than what was coming in and you were trying to figure out how you were going to make ends meet and you walk out there and there's a check from a friend sitting in the mailbox? Have you ever done that? Listen, you were encouraged without anybody saying a word to you. Have you ever had a mentor send you like a book or, or some type of resource in the mail or drop it off on your front porch that you knew was going to help you and you knew that mentor was trying to help you and invest into you? He never said a word or she never said a word. She just did this action that encouraged you and no word was ever spoken. Like we could go on and on with examples like this, but I think that that we have our minds focused on encouraging is just words. We can encourage people with our actions, with our attitudes, and with our hearts. We don't always have to just speak words of encouragement. Another example that, that I see with Barnabas is in Acts chapter 9. If you've never read Acts chapter 9, I beg you to do it. It's one of the most uh, powerful are chapters that shows the power of the gospel, like true transformation. And if you haven't read it, no worries. I'll give you the cliff notes again. Saul was on a mission. He was headed to Damascus to, to persecute, destroy, put in prison, and possibly kill the believers who were following Jesus. He's on the way. He gets blinded by this bright light that came from the Lord, has an encounter and an experience with him. He's blinded for a couple days, but in that moment, his his life is changed forever. And then it says that he immediately began to speak, teach, and lead people in regards to Jesus. Now, listen, I tell this, tell this to you all the time. Like, let's not just read the whole picture. Let's put ourselves in this position for a moment, right? Like this guy, I know, I've heard about him. He's coming and he's trying to persecute me because I'm believing and following the way. I'm following Jesus. And now, just a couple days later, the very thing that he came to persecute me about, he's actually teaching me about. Like, I would be like, what's going on? Well, they did the same thing, and they actually tried to kill him. And we're like, no, we don't trust this guy. We don't know what's going on, and we want him out of here, or we're going to kill him. And so uh, some people who I guess were supporting him and on his side found out they snuck him out, and they helped him go from Damascus, and he was headed back to Jerusalem, all right? So as he's getting to Jerusalem, guess what? He's about to face the same reaction. Check this out in verse 26 of chapter 9. When Saul arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to meet with the believers, but they were all afraid of him. They did not believe he had truly become a believer. Then Barnabas brought him to the apostles and told them how Saul had seen the Lord on the way to Damascus and how the Lord had spoken to Saul. He also told them that Saul had preached boldly in the name of Jesus in Damascus. And we could read a few more, but skip down to verse 31. The church then had peace throughout uh, Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, and it became stronger as the believers lived in fear of the Lord. And with the encouragement of the Holy Spirit, it also grew in numbers. What did Barnabas do? Barnabas vouched for Saul. And yes, he had to speak words to other people, but he never actually spoke to Saul to encourage him. But I can only imagine how Saul must have felt. He has this radical transformation from the gospel of Jesus. His life has changed. He makes a 180 degree turn. He's now trying to live his life for him. And he immediately starts getting pushback and persecution for those that also say they follow the same thing that he's teaching. 
And yet Barnabas comes and says, listen, I need you to listen to this guy. He's the real deal. He has been teaching the right things. He has had a life transformation and he is following after Jesus and he stood up for him. And then if you don't know the rest of the story, what did Saul go on to do? Saul went on, his name was changed to Paul. He planted churches all over everywhere and he's given us half of what we read in the New Testament here. I wonder, I wonder what would have happened to Saul if Barnabas would not have done what he did and encouraged Saul from that aspect. Like what was about to take place in Damascus? They were gonna kill him. And the the reaction seemed to be no different in Jerusalem. I wonder if Barnabas wouldn't have stood up for him and said, hey, you need to listen to this guy if he would have gotten killed. But no, he stood up and he vouched for him, which on the flip side encouraged the mess out of Saul. Like now God is going to move freely and I'm going to get to go step into what God is calling me to do because now I have some people who believe what I'm doing. Like that is encouraging and it's inspiring. I believe, and and I can't necessarily fully back it up to it's 100%, but I can show you stories. I believe behind every great person is a great encourager. Behind every great person is a great encourager. And I love that Barnabas, he's like, listen, it's not about me. It's about the kingdom. And I'm going to vouch for this dude. And look at the fruit of what took place because of that. We can encourage people without using our words, because encouraging others sometimes doesn't require words. The second thing that I want to show you in the life of Barnabas is this. Encouraging others sometimes is all about words. Encouraging others is sometimes all about words. And you're like, Brian, what what are you doing here? Like, all right, well, you just tried to kind of like spin us off. Listen, I did this on purpose. I wanted to share that the other point, the aspect that it's not always about words first. Because if you're like me, when I think of the word encouragement or when I think of the action of encouraging, my mind immediately goes to words. Like I I immediately think, what can I say to this person to encourage them? And it is absolutely a huge part of encouragement. But what I don't want us to do is miss out on what we just learned, miss out on what I just shared. The fact that we can encourage others in more ways than just having a conversation with someone. We can encourage each other with our whole lives, with the way that we live, with our actions and our words. And so encouraging others is sometimes all about words. There's power in words. And so in Acts chapter 11, this, the early church is now growing. It's spreading. It's going all over the place. And it's made, it's made its way into Antioch. Jerusalem is kind of the mother church. Now there's another church growing in Antioch. God is doing some incredible things. Like there is literally a move of God taking place. Jews and Gentiles are getting saved and coming to know. Well, the church in Jerusalem hears about it. And they go to Barnabas and they say, hey, you need to go check this out. All right. So he goes, chapter 11. Verse 22, when the church at Jerusalem heard what had happened, they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw this evidence of God's blessing, he was filled with joy and he encouraged the believers to stay true to the Lord. What do you think he did when it says he encouraged the believers to stay true to the Lord? He spoke words. He, 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 he told them, hey, I'm proud of what you are doing here. Hey, it's incredible what you are doing here. It's incredible that what you are allowing God to do here and the fact that people are coming to Christ. He used his words to teach them more about God and more about the word. He, he used his words to exhort them. And what happens is he leaves, he runs, he goes, get, goes and gets Paul or Saul at the time. He's like, hey, you got to come. They spend a whole year there. And actually, this church is the first place that a group of believers were called Christians. And so this church is literally growing and expanding and a move of God is taking place, obviously solely because this is God's power and he's the one moving. But behind that is a great leader who is encouraging the mess out of these believers. And this church is growing. What if you and I 
What if we used our words to encourage people like this? I wonder what it would look like. I wonder what our churches would look like. I wonder what families would look like. I wonder what our workplaces would look like if we would just take time to speak something encouraging into someone's life. Like words are so powerful. I've been doing uh, a lot of studies recently on the power of the mind. One of my favorite pastors, Pastor Craig Groeschel, he just dropped a new book, and um, I've been reading it. I've been listening to different sermons and kind of just studying uh, some of that. And one of the things that, that, that I've learned recently in regards to the power of the mind is kind of this scientific aspect. And what happens in the brain when someone says something to you or when something happens is when you begin to repeat that, your brain creates a, a neural pathway, all right? Another word for that would be like a rut. Have you ever seen like a rut in the mud? Like, and, and what happens is when you, when, you, when you repeat it, what you're believing, like let's just say somebody has said something to you that is discouraging and you begin to repeat that over and over in your head, it immediately and instantly, constantly and consistently falls down in that rut to where this lie that you have been told or this discouraging thing that you have been told is now something that you actually believe. Because you, your mind, the power of the mind, you've created this pathway in your mind to believe what has been said to you. And I think about that and I think about how many times people have said something to us that has been discouraging and how often we believe that. Like how often someone says something that is not true, that is a lie. And because we have repeated it over and over in our head and we constantly can hear that person saying it again and again, we've created this pathway to where now this lie is a truth in our own mind. And I just wonder if, if anybody has ever said anything to you that was actually encouraging to reverse what was said to you that was discouraging. And so what I want to do today in the next few moments is actually slow down for a second. And as your pastor, I want to encourage you. I want to share a few things with you. And I'm going to actually sit down for this. I brought a chair. I don't rarely, uh, I rarely sit down when, uh, when I preach, but... I feel like there's, there's so much significance in, in what I'm about to do, not because of what I'm doing, but because of what God is going to do through this. Because I believe that there are a lot of you watching right now who have had something said to you, whether it was a coworker, a family member, a spouse, a, who, who knows, that was very discouraging. And maybe it was five years ago, maybe it was five weeks ago, but that discouraging thought has never left your mind. And so what I want to do is spend a few moments sharing some things that are truth from God's word that I hope will begin a process and a journey of you reversing that discouraging thing that you have been believing. All right? The first one I will start with is this. You have value. You have value. The Bible says that you were knitted together in your mother's womb. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And someone has told you that you don't have value, that you're not going to measure up, that you're not going to ever be anything in your life. And you have believed that lie for too long. And I want to encourage you today and remind you today that God's word says you have value. You have been created in the image of God and you have value. You also have purpose. You have purpose. This life is not a mistake. You were not made by mistake. You were placed here for a very specific reason and a purpose. There may be seasons of your life where you are asking yourself, what is my purpose? But just because you doubt and ask does not mean you don't have one. You have a purpose. And someone has told you in your life that you don't. Someone has told you in your life that you are worthless. And it's a lie. And you need to hear these words today. You have purpose. Have a purpose. I have a plan for your life, for you to prosper. You have a purpose. You can have a healthy marriage. You can have a healthy marriage. And maybe because of the past, 
Maybe it's a, 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 a generational thing to where your father, your grandfather, your great-great-grandfather, they've all had unhealthy marriages. They've all had multiple marriages. And you just believe that you're going to follow right into those same footsteps. Or maybe you've been fighting. Maybe you're in a relationship. You've been fighting to make things healthy. You've been struggling. And now you just believe whether your spouse is the one that told you or whether you're allowing the enemy to tell you that your marriage can never be healthy. Can I just remind you that my God and your God brings dead things to life? I think he can restore your marriage. The Bible says that the husband is to love the wife as himself as the wife shows respect to her husband. It's going to take work. It's going to take intentionality. But you can have a healthy marriage. Stop believing the discouraging lie that you can't. You are not a bad parent. You're not a bad parent. And there's some of you listening right now that believe that you are. And maybe your kid is the one who told you that (laughs) because they're savages, right? (laughs) But you're not a bad parent. The Bible says to, to, to train them up in the Lord and they will return. And I think about that all the time, like... There's so many things that take place in the, in the lives of parenting, right? Like it's just this hills and valleys, hills and valleys. And we constantly find ourselves as parents comparing ourselves to other parents and their kids and wondering what it is that we did wrong. Does this mean that we don't have to work hard at parenting? Absolutely not. But if you continue to believe the discouraging lie that you are not a good parent, the actions will follow. You are not a bad parent. Stop believing that lie. You can get out of debt. You can get out of debt. And sometimes it is a long, long uphill battle. But what happens is when we believe that we are always going to be in debt, it changes the way that we live our lives. It changes the decisions that we make. And we make those choices based off the fact that I am in a valley I will never get out of, so I might as well just stay here. It takes a lot of intentionality, a lot of hard work, and a lot of of discipline. But the Bible says to do everything that you do wholeheartedly for the Lord, not for man. And he also says for us not to serve two masters, not to be enslaved to debt. We have the ability to get out and you can get out of debt. You can break that addiction. Actually, you can't but the power of God can. But you are not going to be an addict forever, so stop labeling yourself that. The Bible says that God will, will never place us in a temptation, that he will not give us a way out. It's going to be hard. All of these are hard, but it gives us an opportunity to rely on the Holy Spirit to lead us and the power that comes from that to help break those bondage of addiction. The Bible says that that in our weakness, he, he works best. His strength is known. His strength is felt. His strength works best in our weakness. We are often too weak to break those addictions, but the power of God can do that, and you will not be an addict forever. You don't have to be haunted by your past. You don't have to be haunted by your past. And some of you right now have believed that for far too long. And what that causes, it causes you to live in shame. It causes you to live in guilt. It causes you to stop thinking about where God is taking you because you can't get past where you've been. And you don't have to miss out on what God is going to do because you can't get out of what you have done. The Bible says that That his love and his forgiveness stretches as far as the east is from the west. You've been forgiven. You have been forgiven. And the price of your past has been paid for on Calvary's hill. 
and you can go and you can place your past mistakes and your past decisions at the foot of the cross and you can walk away and leave them there and know that they have been paid in full. Stop believing the lie that you have to live in your past forever. God has something so much bigger for you. The last one I'll share, I could do this all day, is you don't have to hate your life. And for some of you right now, maybe that's a really harsh statement, for, but for others, it's a really big reality. And it goes back to that aspect of value and purpose, and probably all of them, your past, maybe it's addiction. Like you don't have to hate your life. The Bible says the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but I have come to give life and give it abundantly. And it's time for you to take this, this past lie of saying my life is miserable, my life sucks, if you will, and I hate my life, maybe because you've been living your life for yourself and it's time to surrender that, pick up your cross, carry it, and live for Christ. Let's stop believing these discouraging lies that you've been told, and maybe none of those relate to you, but think about those in your mind. What are the things that I have been said or that I have experienced that have discouraged me and I've allowed to repeat over and over and over? And find something to reverse that. Find something encouraging, whether you have to say it to yourself. But the challenge today, church, is for us to be that voice of encouragement to other people. I believe wholeheartedly that somebody just got encouraged. And again, I'm not here to toot my horn, but can I just tell you something? You feel encouraged? It took me two breaths and two sentences to say something to make you feel encouraged. Like we can do this day in and day out with everybody that we come in contact with. Our words are so powerful. Encouraging others is sometimes not about words. Encouraging others is sometimes all about words. The last thing that I'll share and we'll wrap up is this. Encouraging others is sometimes all about sacrifice. It's all about sacrifice. Let me show you this in, in Acts chapter 14. And this is what most people know Barnabas as uh, or if they've heard of him, is this, okay? So they went on this first missionary journey together, Paul and Barnabas. They, they, they planted churches like they're doing incredible work for the Lord. And here we go, verse 36 of chapter 15. After some time, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit each city where we previously preached the word of the Lord to see how the new believers are doing. Barnabas agreed, but wanted to take along John Mark. But Paul disagreed strongly. Since John Mark had deserted them in Pamphylia, however you want to say that word, and had not continued with them in their work, their disagreement was so sharp that they separated. Barnabas took John Mark with him and sailed for Cyprus. Paul chose Silas, and as he left, the believers entrusted him to the Lord's gracious care. Then he traveled throughout Syria and Sicilia, strengthening the churches there. Okay? So it's easy to look at disagreement as like this is some big negative. Here's what I see because I, I see the character and the man that God's word has given us about who Barnabas was, a man strong in his faith, a man filled with the spirit, a man that was a natural encourager. And I believe that he took John Mark under his wing so that he could encourage him. Think about what might have happened. Like, I believe that Barnabas probably wanted to go back and visit some of the things that he started, right? Like, we want to follow up. We're hearing that they're doing well. Let's go check on them. Me and Paul, we just had this incredible missionary journey, and I want to go back and see some of that fruit. But instead, he took sacrifice, and he received, and he said, listen, I understand that you don't want John Mark to go. That's fine. You go ahead and go your way. I'm going to stay here and me and John Mark are going to go. Can you imagine how encouraging that was to John Mark? And most, some scholars believe that, you know, John Mark was, was Barnabas' cousin. It was kind of like this, this blood is thicker than, than water. You know what I mean? Like, hey, he's my, he's my blood. I'm going to stick with him. But, but, but what would have happened to John Mark? 
And so what we sometimes see as this negative because they have a disagreement, guess what happened? Two powerful people who were changing the world with the gospel, Paul and Barnabas, who were together for a long time. Now guess what? Now there's two teams and they're in two totally different areas. And John Mark was encouraged because Barnabas was willing to sacrifice going to do what he possibly wanted to do to now go on a journey with him. And because of that, the gospel was spread even further. And here's what I really want you to hear. I believe that sometimes we choose not to encourage people because we're afraid they're going to make it further than us. Like we're afraid they're going to excel in different seasons or different places than what we have. And we we, like what we just talked, we know the power of encouragement, guys. We know that. We know that being encouraged feels good. It's, It's motivating. Like we know there's power in that. And we will sometimes choose to withhold encouraging someone because maybe we're intimidated by them. Maybe it's at our uh, a coworker who we're afraid is going to do better than us and take our own job. Like, like when we choose to withhold that. But that's not what God wants us to do. And sometimes encouraging someone else is going to take you to sacrifice. I, I, I want to close with this story. And I wouldn't say that I've done a full-blown sacrifice by this, but, but I think about how my heart and the heartbeat of this church is to raise people up, send them out, and watch them do better for the gospel and for the kingdom than we do ourselves. Like, that's our heart. When, when I first moved here, and I'm closing with this story, I promise, I met a young kid who was a freshman in high school at the time, and I saw something in him that I knew was going to just change the world. And I spent several years with him and, and, and trying to mentor him and invest into him and encourage him. And, and I, I love to, to speak at different conferences and places. And anytime uh, I have one kind of close by, I would always call this kid up as well as a few others and invite him to join along. And every time I would, I would extend that invitation, I would always see this young man's eyes light up. And this young man's name is Caleb. And you've seen him on our host videos, probably in our kids ministry uh, services as well. But I would always see him get so encouraged to be able to go to a conference or to a speaking engagement and be a part of that. Well, about two weeks ago, I got a phone call from a pastor in North Carolina who was calling to, uh, he had a conference plan, wanted me to come speak at it. And he started talking, he's like, hey, I want you to come and, and preach. And he said, and I also, I want Caleb to come and preach as well. And so I got to call Caleb and, and FaceTime him and, and say, hey, listen, I got a conference that I want you to come to with me again. And it's down in North Carolina. And he's like, yeah, that's awesome. Let's do this. And I said, the kicker is you're preaching Saturday and I'm preaching Sunday. And his eyes just lit up, man. He, I mean, he was so encouraged by it. And I share that story with you because that is who we want to be, to be able to say, listen, we want to encourage you, to bake you, help you, lead you, guide you, to step into all that God is calling you, even if it's more than what we're doing here, even if it means leaving from what we're doing here. Like, we don't want to be controlling and possessive. We want people to live out the calling that God has for their life And we get to play a part of that by encouraging people. So let's not waver in encouraging people. Sometimes it's not about words. Sometimes it's all about words. And sometimes it takes sacrifice. So as you reflect in your own heart and your own mind, how well are you doing at encouraging people? How well are you doing encouraging people? It's it's really not hard. It's really not hard at all. It, it, and it doesn't take long. It, it really doesn't. And you never know what your words or your actions may do to someone's life. And sometimes we see the fruit of that immediately, and sometimes we never see it. That's not our part. Our part is to be an encourager. Church, that's who we want to be. That's who we're called to be as believers. Let's build each other up. There's too much tearing down going around and the church should not be the one who is playing a part of that. Let's build each other up. Let's encourage other people. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. We thank you so much that you've given us everything we need to shine a light in a dark world. 
And we understand that part of that comes from allowing us the opportunity to encourage others. God, I pray that you would help us to reflect in our own lives and ask ourselves, how well are we being, are doing at encouraging others? Are, 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 we, are we encouraging people with our words? Are we encouraging people with our actions? And do we have this encouraging spirit in our hearts and in our lives to where we want to see people even do better than ourselves and excel in ways that we never could have? And we encourage them to do so. God, I pray that you would help us as a church that to be encouraging, that people would come and they would feel encouraged, they would feel refreshed week in and week out. And God, I pray that you would help us as individual believers to encourage the people that you have placed in our lives. Father, we love you. We thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Sorry.